This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the Eau Claire Area School Board. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. I call to order the June 3rd, 2019 regular meeting of the Eau Claire Area School District School Board. Dr. Hardebeck is actually going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. I invite everyone to join in and please stand if you'd like. Welcome everyone, thank you for taking time out of your evening to be with us tonight, either in person or remotely. This meeting is broadcast on Charter Channel 994, WRFP 101.9 FM, and also online at valleymediaworks.org. Uh, Secretary Iverson, are we in compliance with open meeting law notification? Yes, we are. Would you call the roll to verify that we have a quorum? Commissioner Bika? Here. Commissioner Harder? Here. Commissioner Clankhammer. Commissioner Lugenbill. Here. Commissioner Torres. Commissioner Boo. Here. Commissioner Nordine. Here. Well, we have the five required members for a quorum. So it's very important for board members to hear community views on school district activities, and one of the mechanisms for sharing information is the public forum. It's the first 30 minutes of every regular meeting that we reserve for citizens to hear or to share comments on agenda items or other topics that are important to them. Please know that the public forum is not to be used as a mechanism for airing concerns or complaints about school personnel or any other person connected with the Eau Claire area schools. Each citizen will have up to four minutes to address the board, provided that they have new information. And by new information, we mean information that has not already been covered by another speaker at this meeting. Six people have signed up for tonight. When your name is called, please come to the podium if you're able. Please first state your name, give your address, and then go right on to your comments. And the first person is Nancy Brenner. I have a little photo. Is it possible to put it on the dot camera and show that at the right time? My name is Nancy Brenner. I live at 1405 Virginia Lane, Eau Claire, and I am proud to be a Sam Baby Dolphin. Several years ago, the ECASD adopted PBAS, a framework for teaching and modeling behavior expectations. Beginning in 2013, under a new administrator, Sam Baby built a successful universal and tier two teams, and a strong PBIS program, even receiving silver and platinum distinctions for fidelity to that program. Under the PBIS framework, we teach students that mistakes are made, but tomorrow is a new day, a fresh start, and a chance to make restitution. One of the cool tools that we use to accomplish this is a focus on a monthly character trait to help students mold their behavior under such categories as honesty, integrity, and kindness. And I have my picture here now. Where would you like me to? Is that visible? On here. There we go. All right. So this is a picture of our marquee. We always try to use our marquee to share our teaching goals with our stakeholders and with our community. We even have neighbors who have commented about how much they like our signs. For the month of May, the focus has been fairness. Sam Davy teachers, parents, and most importantly, Sam Davy students have not been treated fairly recently. So I'm here as an invitation to Dr. Hardebeck and all the board members to come to our school and speak to all of us, to hear all of the good things that are happening at Sam Davy, to hear our voices, and to listen with the respect and the fairness that we deserve. I also have some additional letters from staff that were not able to be here tonight that I'd like to leave for the board, also for your recommendation. Thank you for your time this evening. Sarah O'Mara. Hello, my name is Sarah O'Mara, 2611 Edgewood Lane, Eau Claire, 03. 
Um, I have been a Sam Davy parent for the last eight years, and I myself am a Sam Davy Dolphin, having attended kindergarten through sixth grade. When we were purchasing our home, we specifically looked on the north side of Eau Claire so our children could attend this wonderful school. Davy has a long history of being a safe and welcoming school filled with educators who pride themselves on making, a, on making the first few years of a child's educational journey as easy and fulfilling as possible. However, in the past few months, the ease with which our school operates has been shaken and our children are left with questions to which we have no answers. We teach our children that open and honest communication between people is the best way to ensure that there is no, there is no confusion or misunderstanding and even if you make a mistake, you should own up to it, make amends, and move on. We do not hide our actions behind it, distractions or misinformation. We do not accept excuses or avoid our responsibilities. Because of this, our children have come to expect the truth from their trusted adults, and when they see an unexplained issue in their everyday lives, their curiosity soon turns to questioning, then to speculation, then to anxiety over what may change next. Please help us reassure our children that their school will once again be the efficiently functioning center of education that they have come to expect. Thank you. Alicia Renger. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alicia. Um, I am a mother of three children. Um, that have been established students within the Eau Claire School District um, for 11 years now. Um, I have a seventh grader, a fourth grader, and a kindergartner. Um, they happily attend North Star and Northwoods on the north side of Eau Claire. Um, due to unique circumstances, my family uh, recently moved out of an Eau Claire area um, school district address to what is now considered its Altoona um, address onto the north side of Eau Claire. Um, one of the deciding factors to make the final decision to move was that our children would be approved with open enrollment and remain at their schools. Um, in fact, when we told our children this is where we're moving, the first thing out of their mouths was, can we still go to our same schools? Um, we move forward with our move um, off of the information that my husband received saying it will be fine moving forward. Um, after moving, we were then informed our children will be relocated um, to Locust Lane. Um, we are not as concerned with the distance it takes to take our children to the school as it is um, specifically um, the well-being of our kids. Um, we have a four-year-old daughter who will now have to transition to a brand new school for one year and transfer back transition into another brand new school for middle school. Um, I understand budget is tight. Um, one reply I received was, this will cost the district too much. I'm sorry, um, this is about numbers. Um, my daughter is already a number at the school. Um, I don't understand how keeping her at Northwoods is going to cost you more. Um, She's been there for four years. Um, we speak about mental health awareness and we question with everything that's going on in our schools in America today, we wonder, well, what can we do? And you're probably wondering where I'm going with this, but if nothing comes out of me saying my personal story tonight, it's just for you to hear this. We ask how we can prevent suicides and violence in our youth. And I say that it starts with topics just just like these. And they may seem small on paper, it may not seem to matter to shuffle some numbers or you know, draw a line in a different, in a different um, cross some houses and just shift them over there. Um, but it matters greatly to our kids. That is one source of their security and their constant in their lives. Um, to my child, it's not small. Um, in this stage of her life, it's huge. The hallways she has been familiar with the past four years and the people matter. She loves Northwoods and her friends there. This is what she's known. I just ask that you consider my story tonight to take interest, um, the best interest of our children 
can, my suggestion would be to reconsider your process in the, the situations regarding your approvals and denials for open enroll enrollment requests. Thanks for your time. Sarah Hendrick. And Sarah, when you come to the podium, if you could say your name and your address, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Hendrick. My address is 2028 12th Street. I'm a Lakeshore parent. I have two children going into first grade and third grade next year. Over the past three years, my family has created and nurtured many, very, very many positive relationships with our teachers, support staff, fellow students, and families. My family is very involved with our school, attending nearly every family activity. I'm an active member of the Lakeshore Elementary Parent Teacher Organization, and I'm co-chair of the Communications Committee. We are a very engaged family. My husband and I feel that teaching our children the importance of community and involvement in your school is very important. I want to thank the Demographic Trends Planning Committee for all of their hard work. This has been a very arduous process. Something that stands out to me, though, is during this entire process, all the issues that have come up during the listening sessions. It seems as though this all started with solving an issue for creating more space for the upcoming increase in 4K enrollment and the overcrowding at certain schools. I respect the recommendations of the Demographic Tr Trends and Planning Committee. And I'm also very thankful for all of the parent involvement, involvement in all of the listening, listening sessions. We have a very wonderful community who care about our children and their schooling. However, I feel that after all of this work, we're still not solving one of the main issues that we need to find a functional space for our upcoming 4K enrollment. A problem that could drastically change if the state moves to an all-day 4K curriculum. Also, adjusting the seven Northside Elementary School borders affects over 250 students. It's not necessary. If we are trying to solve an issue of overcrowding and low enrollment, let's take a look at those schools individually. I urge you to look at the solutions that affect the lowest number of families possible. Tonight, you have a decision to make about the future of my family and nearly 250 children on the north side and their families. Please take time in making your decision about what these boundary changes would really solve. Is it necessary to involve all seven schools? We still do not have a solution for the needed space for the upcoming 4K enrollment. Thank you for acting with care while thinking of my family and the hundreds of other families that this would affect in your vote tonight. Kelly Hendrickson. My name is Kelly Hendrickson. I live at 1324 Caden Court in Eau Claire. Tonight's vote about the north side boundaries is a major decision. A small group of Roosevelt parents and I started a subcommittee of our PTA in October of last year to gather more information and make ourselves aware of the challenges facing our district. I'm asking you tonight to think about the email I sent to you earlier today titled Community Plan 2.0 and see if the changes I am proposing would check all the necessary boxes. The plan would call for the Roosevelt boundary area north of Highway 312 to change to Sherman, but to allow a transition plan for all current Roosevelt students so that they could complete their elementary career at the same school. Our enrollment currently sits at 90% and would stay at that number until the 2020-2021 school year when all incoming kindergarten students in that area would attend Sherman. Any K-5 through students that move into the new developments would also be started at Sherman. We've continuously heard that we are causing harm or trauma to our students by letting them attend a school that is at 90% capacity. If I thought that was true, I would be the first one to point it out and demand something be done about it. I think hearing from the Roosevelt parents during the board meetings and listening sessions speaks volumes to the quality and first-rate education my children are receiving at Roosevelt, and we don't want to lose that. My plan would also shift a small section of 20 Lakeshore students to Sherman. This is section nine on the demographics and trends map. This would bring Lakeshore's numbers down to 84%. The plan also leaves the five unused classrooms at Locust Lane available for use as 4K space. The harm that will be caused would be by approving the demographic and trends committee proposal to shift 275 kids in and out of the seven Northside schools. 
it doesn't address the headache that will be caused by where these kids, especially in sections one and eight of the demo and trends map, will go to middle school. Will they get to start sixth grade with their entire class or only a handful of familiar faces? Will siblings who are only a few years apart in school need to attend different middle schools? The Demographics and Trends Plan also doesn't address the need for more 4K space, which has seemed to be a main driver in this whole process. Will the public be willing to pass a referendum for 13 to 14 million dollars for a new 4K facility or renovation of Prairie Ridge, knowing that unused classroom space at Locust Lane could have been converted for 4K needs for a minimal cost to the district? This board asked for community input and held seven listening sessions across the district. Many parents showed up and great discussion and ideas were voiced. The demographic and trends map and recommendation has not changed since it was created before the listening sessions, except to correct an error that would have brought Roosevelt down to 56% capacity. No input was taken from the seven listening sessions and used in the final proposal. I know the decision you need to make tonight is not an easy one, and I appreciate being able to voice my concerns. Thank you. Justin Hendrickson. Justin Hendrickson, 1324 Caden Court. Over the past six months, the community has given you a significant amount of feedback about the planned Northside redistricting. At nearly every school meeting, one or more Roosevelt parents have spoken during the public comment section. At the listening sessions, parents from around the district asked questions, made suggestions, and filled out comment cards. I'm sure you've received numerous letters and emails. My wife created an alternative plan, worked with board members, and uh, Demographic and Trends members and submitted it to the full Demographic and Trends Committee for review. When they dismissed our plan, we made modifications to address their concerns. Nonetheless, the Demographic and Trends Plan in front of you today was created in January and contains only a single modification for, from community feedback, a fix for a mistake that would have taken Roosevelt down to 56% capacity. It's hard to describe how angry, frustrated, and dejected I feel about my participation in this process. And I know I'm not the only one. But there's still time. You can choose to not approve the demographic and trends recommendation, or you could choose to, to approve the alternative plan, or you could send this back to demographics and trends for more information and request they incorporate community feedback. I hope you make the right choice. Thank you. This brings us to item 3.1, which is the superintendent's report. Dr. Hardiman. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to review the events uh, for the, uh, the upcoming events for the school board. Um, all of the meetings will take place at the administration building unless otherwise noted. Um, on June 5th, there will be the McKinley Competency Graduation, which will take place at DeLong, and that's at 7 p.m. On June 10th, at 3 p.m., the Revenue Committee will meet. On June 18th, at 4.30, the Eau Claire Virtual School Board will meet. On July 22nd, at 8.45 a.m., Policy and Governance will meet, and that will be followed on July 22nd at 7 p.m. by a regular meeting of the school board. So tonight we have a number of recognitions, and uh, we're going to start by recognizing Jerry Shea, and he's sitting there on the front row. Jerry, we're going to ask you to stand, if you would. Um, each year, the Wisconsin Association of School District Administrators nominates people in the community, in their particular communities, for the Burt Grover Child Advocacy Recognition. And this year, we nominated Jerry. Um, as president of Market and Johnson, uh, Jerry has been a strong advocate for our district and our students and has demonstrated himself to be a generous and thoughtful member of our community. He has led Market and Johnson in partnering with our school district in several different ways. For example, he was instrumental in establishing Market and Johnson as a host site for youth apprenticeship students. And he has supported many facility projects throughout the district by providing expertise and, of course, his incredible service. 
and it's fair to say that thousands of Eau Claire students from across our large district have and will benefit from Jerry's support as well as the support of Market and Johnson. So Jerry, we want to thank you for the support and we want to thank you very much for just being part of ECASD. And we have a certificate to present to you. Our next recognition is for Longfellow Elementary School. Um, Principal Sarah Fisher and some of the Longfellow staff are here tonight to be recognizing for receiving the Title I School of Recognition Beating the Odds Award. And Sarah, if you could stand up, do you have some of your staff with you tonight? Are you? I can't remember, I have no dates. Okay. <laughs> Well, it is the 14th time that you have, you and your school have received this award, and it's the 10th year in a row. Um, this is quite an honor for Longfellow because those schools that are designated as beating the odds are in the top 25% of high poverty schools in the state, and they have above average student achievement in reading and math. So, Sarah, I'm just going to say keep up the good work, and let's go for year 15. So DeLong participated in the 2019 Wisconsin Mathematics Council Contest, and there were 60 teams with 480 student participants. DeLong placed first in the Class AA division. Ryan Hall received a perfect score and was named first team All-State. All-State first team members were William Sylvester, Cage uh, Detbarn, Ed McGee, and Andrew Nimitz. Paxton Bush, Ting Ting Yang, and Ethan Knudsen were named second team All-State. DeLong has come in first place seven of the last years and first place every year for the last six years. Um, Karen uh, Waja is the eighth grade math teacher and Michelle Johnson is the gifted and talented coordinator who works with them. So I think some of the students are here tonight as well as our staff and if you would stand and be recognized from DeLong that would be great. <laughs> And as always, Principal O'Reilly is on hand to support the team. Yeah. <laughs> um, North High School also participated in the 2019 High School State Mathematics Contest sponsored by the Wisconsin Mathematics Council. And I don't believe that anyone was able to make it tonight. Is anyone here from North, from the North team? Um, their team took second uh, in the large school division, and Nicole Samuelson was named to the All-State first team for her performance, and only eight individuals are selected for this honor. So their team members included Brady France, Asher Jewell, Ethan Johnson, Samantha Lang, Peyton Obricki, Nicole Samuelson, Nathan Strimka, and Eliza uh, Weigel. Their math team advisor is Paul Haslow, and so um, he was kind enough to let us know that they wouldn't be able to make it tonight, but we recognize them at any rate and we are say congratulations to North. <laughs> so this is the time of year when we celebrate uh, graduations and we see another uh, set of seniors off um, into their futures. And we certainly had two beautiful graduations last week with North and with uh, Memorial. And this week, uh, our McKinley graduates will finish their competency programs and celebrate that completion. So I want to congratulate all the students. And I want to particularly thank the staff and all the families for their support as we got another cohort of students across the stages. We're going to take a little transition right now. And uh, Dr. Bika and I are going to make a special recognition and um, as you know, 
Our, our own Patty Iverson is retiring after uh, more than 30 years um, as the assistant to the superintendent and the secretary to the school board. Um, we have had and will continue to have many opportunities to recognize her and kind of say a long goodbye, but we wanted to recognize this as your last board meeting. And I've said this many, many times, and I'm going to say it again. Someone will take Patty's place, but no one will replace her. She has become mission control. Uh, for all of the administration um, and I think also for the school board. Um, she keeps us on track. She keeps us organized. Uh, she, always with her great smile, she keeps us in good humor. And um, I'm not going to say goodbye to you. I'm just going to say congratulations on your retirement, but we know you'll be back. to say something also to Patty. <clears throat> um, it's board members and a superintendent and members of the executive team who are often the ones in a position to make decisions that get all the attention. But in fact, more important to the long-term help and effectiveness of Eau Claire schools is a staff position that may receive very little attention. And away from the headlines, there's been one person who for almost 34 years has kept the district's focus stabilized its energy, guided its purposes, recorded its story, and emanated the sense of joy that lives at the heart of its mission, and that is you, Patty Iverson. Since I joined the board, I've actually watched you rather closely. And to you, every activity and every choice comes back to how can we help our students and our staff. And to every good idea, you say, how can we make this work? It's had a profound influence on my development of a board as a board member, and I'm sure on the development of every other board member who has been fortunate enough to work with you. Um, my deepest thanks, Patty. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, there is no president's report this evening, but I do want to take a moment at the special time, which it's the end of our school year, to say thank you from the board to all school staff for the respect and the care that you give to our students and families. A very special thank you to our teachers. I know of no profession whose members give so selflessly of their minds and also of their hearts. Students and families, you had a great year. Congratulations to all of our graduates, and know that wherever you go, we are here for you, and I hope you know we, that you can always call Eau Claire your home. So now is the time that is, it's reserved for reports, uh, usually for reports of student representatives, but we have two new student representatives for the 2019-2020 academic year. And so it's a time dedicated to formal introductions. Commissioner Luganbill will do those honors. Thank you. Well, each year it's always a pleasure for me to interview and help select our student representatives to the school board. Um, interviewing students is such a joy because uh, in our time spent interviewing and talking with the students who are all candidates for the position, they have so much passion for their school, uh, they're so ambitious, and they're so involved. Um, this is a crucial role that ensures that at every meeting, uh, the voice and perspective 
of students is well heard and is always present. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our new student representatives for the 2019-20 school year. Uh, both of these students came highly recommended by their teachers, counselors, peers, and first I would like to recognize Johnny Zhang from North High School. Uh, Johnny could not be here tonight due to a family emergency, but I will still read his biography. Uh, so Johnny is an incoming senior at North High School. He's a leader of the North High School Hmong Club and was an advocate for the new Hmong Studies program. Um, he's also been on the soccer team and founded the breakdancing group at North called the Floor Dusters. Um, I think that's his greatest qualification for the position, frankly. Uh, but uh, his principal uh, talked at length about how he's already very willing to come in, come to the office, and talk to the administrators with his ideas or concerns already, which is great. Uh, and we really look forward to having him in the role. So let's give it up for Johnny in case he's live streaming this. And, and I look forward uh, to having all of you meet him. Our other new student representative is Morgan Prem from Memorial High School, and Morgan is in the back. So if you would like to stand so everyone can see you, and I'll go ahead and I'll read your biography. Uh, Morgan is an incoming senior at Memorial. She's a leader in the student body, involved with a number of school organizations, clubs, athletics, including the cross-country team. She's also a recent graduate of the 2019 Youth Leadership Eau Claire program through the Eau Claire Chamber of Commerce. You may recognize her last name as her older sister, Lauren, served as our student representative for Memorial a few years ago and did such a wonderful job. And I know Morgan was able to see her and look up to that. And um, I know that she'll do a great job, too. And your parents should be very proud of both of you. So uh, we're greatly looking forward to working with both Johnny and Morgan in the coming year. And as a former student representative, I know that you will find this opportunity to be informative, exciting, and a great leadership development opportunity. So thank you, and congratulations. Item five, other reports. Do any board members have a committee report to share? Commissioner Harder. Yeah, the budget development uh, committee met last week, and uh, we discussed the, uh, the OPEB uh, work that's ongoing and made some progress on that. Are there other reports, or are there any legislative updates? Uh, the biggest legislative item that's come up over the last two weeks was that on uh, March 23rd, the Joint Finance Committee passed an omnibus motion along party lines regarding the K-12 school funding for the upcoming budget. Uh, the budget passed by the Joint Finance Committee does increase spending for K-12 schools by about $500 million. Uh, which includes a $200 uh, dollar per pupil increase over the, for the next year's budget and a $204 dollar increase for uh, the revenue caps. Uh, it also increases special aid uh, categorical funding to 30%. Um, and while it's a good thing that the Joint Finance Committee is recommending increasing funding for education, uh, the $500 million that they passed is almost $900 million less than was proposed in Governor Evers' budget. And the 30% special education funding, only half what the governor proposed. And also one-third of the 90% in special education uh, compensation that's allocated to voucher schools. Uh, additionally, it's less than the $634 million increase that the legislature approved in Governor Walker's final budget. Um, and so if you are so inclined, I would invite you to contact your legislators and act them, ask them to commit more fully to supporting our public schools. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments about the report or the update? So for item six, uh, for each item appearing under number six, the consent resolution agenda, board members have been given background information and or have discussed the item during a previous meeting. Therefore, these items will be acted upon with one vote and without discussion. 
If a board member wants to discuss any of these items, simply indicate this interest after I have read the item. We'll remove it from the consent agenda and vote on the item separately. I would entertain a motion to approve item 6.2 through 6.9 of the consent resolution, which are as follows. Adopt the minutes of the closed session, May 6, 2019. Minutes of May 20th, 2019. Minutes of closed session, May 20th, 2019. Human Resources Employment Report. Pull that, please. 2019-2020 Open Enrollment Applications. Approve the 2019-20 Employee Handbook Modifications. Adopt New Policy 886, District and Tribal Communication and Collaboration. Uh, revisions to Policy 332, Learning Environments and Partnerships, LEAP Zones. Uh, is there a motion to approve or adopt items 6.2 through 6.9 with the exception of 6.5 of the consent resolution agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Uh, now can we have a motion to approve item 6.5, human, re uh, human resources employment report? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Commissioner Luganville, as you uh, requested to pull the item, is there anything that you would like to discuss? No, I just have to abstain from this, uh, from the summer school piece specifically. Uh, discussion from anyone else? Okay. Uh, those in favor of approving this item signify by saying uh, aye. Aye. Those who are opposed, say nay. Abstain. And the motion passes. This takes us to our one individually considered resolution for this meeting. It's item 7.1, recommendations regarding elementary school facilities and boundaries from the demographic trends and facility, uh, facility planning committee. This is Ms., uh, Ms. Kim Kohler and Mr. Phil Lyons. So um, Phil and I are back tonight to talk with you about the Demographic Trends Facility Planning Committee recommendation um, and to field any questions um, that you might have regarding the current recommendation. Before we um, get to that, I, I wanted to talk a little bit just about the history. Um, many of you know that um, I, my work with this began um, this school year, so I thought I'd review just some of the work that we did. Um, this school year um, from a recommendation that actually came before the board last May. So in, on October 8th, um, 2018, um, Phil and I were before the board and um, presented recommendations to you from the committee regarding the establishment of um, elementary boundaries, really in two phases. Um, the first phase on um, the northern part of the district and then a plan uh, for the southern part of the district once we could um, develop a facility plan um, for um, for that part of the district. And within that plan, we um, proposed uh, listening sessions over the course of the winter so that a decision could be made this spring. Um, and the reason that we really hoped for a decision to be made this spring was so that we could provide time to help transition families. The, as we um, transition families, they, um, families and students require a lot of support, um, a lot of TLC, and quite a bit of planning. Um, so the committee recognized that and really wanted to make sure that um, we provided um, that time to the families. Uh, we reported after the listening sessions on April 15th, 2019, making a recommendation and indicated that we were waiting a um, board decision. In fact, at that time, um, the notes reflect that I said the most pressing issue would be the reestablishment of boundaries to smooth enrollments. Um, that was the most pressing issue before demographic trends. Um, on May 6th, we presented a summary of the work session. If you remember, on April 15th, when Phil and I presented, we presented a recommendation from the board. There was a community recommendation um, that we thought um, deserved a closer look so um, a work group I think Commissioner Luganville you asked if a work group could take a peek at that um, so the work group did take a peek at that um, 
And at that presentation, uh, what Phil and I shared was we'd like to take that community proposal to the full committee on May 16th, present to the board on May 20th so that we could have a uh, board decision on June 3rd. So we did that and a couple of weeks ago, Phil and I were up here <laughs> on uh, May 20th, we presented our um, recommendation to the board and Commissioner Nord Nordine asked if we could be placed on the individually considered resolution agenda for tonight um, for perhaps a, a decision by the board. And with that, um, Phil and I would like to just review what that recommendation was. Um, from a couple of weeks ago, but also one that really summarizes the work of the committee over the last couple of years. So I'm going to turn it over to Phil to do that. Thanks. <clears throat> so as you'll recall, at the May 20th board meeting, the committee uh, shared its recommendation to smooth the enrollments uh, in the elementary schools in the northern part of the district by uh, retaining Roosevelt as a two-section school and reestablishing elementary boundaries in the surrounding areas. The committee uh, also recommended that the next step would be to develop a facility plan to address capacity in overcrowded schools in the southern part of the district and at Prairie Ridge. And you can see that that plan is outlined here. Uh, we referred to it as option three, but uh, this was the one that the committee nearly unanimously supported. And uh, we called it seven schools with a two-section Roosevelt. Uh, the committee indicated the boundaries would be with, uh, redrawn in the section of the district that's shown here. Uh, with these boundary changes, capacity at the schools in this area would nearly all fall uh, in between 70 and 80 percent capacity, uh, something that the committee talked a great deal about, um, which is neither under capacity uh, nor is it over capacity. The plan does impact about two to three hundred students. And in order to support the students and families through that transition, the committee recommends that these changes take place in the 2020 2021 school year. So not in this in this one that's coming. In the committee next steps uh, await board approval of the elementary facilities recommendation, uh, determine impact on and a plan for the middle school boundaries, study the 4K and the elementary expansion options to make a future recommendation to the board, and uh, await appointment of board members to the committee. And with that, we'll take uh, some questions and discussions. But I did want to take a few seconds and build upon uh, something that, that Kim was, was talking about. Uh, about midway through my time on the Demo Trends Committee, uh, Kim joined us. So my experience and my time on the committee actually goes back even more than three years. And I was even getting a lot of questions today uh, via email by uh, concerned folks just wanting to know about the process and how the maps were drawn, all of the decision points that the committee went through to get to the decisions that we made, and that whole process from beginning to end. So I spent a little bit over three years on the committee, and I, I remember going back to that original Roosevelt uh, decision that in the principles of the committee was to expand it from a two-section school to a three-section school, expanding a school that was really at overcapacity and surrounded by a number of schools that were under capacity. Also at that same time there was a brand new subdivision in Princeton Valley called High Clare. And High Clare did not have an elementary assigned to it. So those two items started the process by the committee in looking at all of the schools and trying to get Locust Lane for example above 53 percent capacity in addressing Longfellow and moving it above 55% capacity, and in dealing with a couple of pockets in, in the north area that were over capacity by smoothing out those enrollments throughout the district. Um, there were many, many sessions and work groups, primarily uh, in late 17, early 18, that were um, exercises where we had some expertise that put maps uh, up on uh, an overhead with real-time populations 
that were dropped into those maps and gave us some transparency into what that meant to a particular district if we moved those boundary lines. And through that, the maps were developed until the decision really on the dual immersion. And then we had to, to go back and redo a number of these maps and, and offer the board some, some different options to look at that drove those principles of being above 65% capacity and being at or below 90% capacity, which the committee has, has really thought that maybe a better number is 85. So I just wanted to give that little background as well because I, Kim joined us about a, a year ago and, and uh, Abby worked with us up until that point and I think that the full three years of a review is probably um, needed to be articulated tonight. Questions? Yeah, I, um, I have a couple questions to help with this process tonight. Um, one is, the, I'm wondering if anyone could speak to the um, constituent concerns that we have received specifically regarding Princeton Valley area. And the, um, I know that we've had kind of an influx of those mm -hmm. in the past 48 hours. So I'm wondering if, uh, and so there hasn't been an opportunity to communicate back to the board necessarily on those. So I'm wondering uh, um, if you'd be able to speak to that. And I have another question, but I'll let you do that one first. Sure. Uh, one of those questions was actually directed uh, uh, in an email to me as well. Um, and what it, what it called out is, did the committee fully understand the geographic issues of Princeton Valley and its proximity uh, to Northwoods. So Northwoods, um, I believe 80, what's the capacity at Northwoods? 80%. 80 so the capacity at Northwoods was 80%. And the capacity at Locust Lane, 53%. Um, it, we had many conversations about do we want that entire area to be in that particular school district, Northwoods. We felt and were concerned that if we did move that into Northwoods, that it only drove the Northwoods numbers up and near at 90% capacity, while still did not do anything for the, the capacity at Locust Lane, which was at the time 52-53%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other piece is just a little bit about the geography of the district as a whole. Um, if you look at opportunities for growth, um, Locust Lane is landlocked. Um, as the northern boundary of Locust Lane um, borders um, the Chippewa Falls School District. So if you look for any development near Locust Lane, it likely wouldn't come um, to the Eau Claire School District. On the other hand, um, Northwoods has a lot of um, square miles um, that could be developed and could be potential for um, growth in the Eau Claire School District. So um, there wasn't really an opportunity. We had looked at data um, over a number of years and Roosevelt had really been hovering about where it was at um, for 10 years or more and just looking at the potential of any development in that area probably wasn't going to wasn't going to happen the other thing um, one of the principles of the committee is really to um, um, balance demographics um, particularly socioeconomic de demographics and one of the things that um, moving that neighborhood does is it brings um, Locust Lane and Northwoods more in line with one another as far as socioeconomic makeup of the students um, so I actually joined the Demographics and Trends Committee, the exact same class, if you will, as Phil. So we've been working together for the entire time that we've sat on the committee. Um, and I just wanted to point out that when the committee came with its recommendation for High Clare to go to Locust Lane, at that time it was explained that the, the uh, intention was to, once the larger picture was uh, drawn for addressing all of the issues of demographics and trends, that uh, the Princeton Valley area would be moving to Locust Lane at that point. Um, and so that it was, well, we have to do something with High Clare because those houses are close to being built uh, or are finished, and we will have students moving, and they need to know where they're going to school, and eventually we'll bring that uh, together. 
there had there was a lot of discussion on the idea that there's only one exit from Princeton Valley onto North Crossing and that it does go very close to Northwoods but right. in the end the committee said that keeping that together and not running two buses out of there was uh, more important uh, than the absolute proximity to uh, via via road you know the, the as the crow flies proximity is roughly the same but of course there's no way to drive up the hill at, uh, by High Clare across to Lucas Lane I'll probably have some more information to share later if that needs to be so I'll be participating sort of as a committee member and a board member I guess Would it be okay if I ask my one other? Please do. Um, Process-wise, uh, you would be seeking to have the recommended changes take effect for 2020-21. Correct. School year. So if the board were to approve your recommendation or recommendations, what kind of a timeline or how quickly would you then look to have firmed up a plan for middle school enrollment as well as the question of the questions of um, uh, grandfathering, concurrent enrollment, and a transition plan, how how much time would you want to have in between the decision being made by the board for that and those plans being firmed up? Uh, we'd like to start working on it immediately. Uh, I think that the um, the work that would be needed to look at balancing or if there's any impact to the middle schools would not be as heavy of a lift as all of the elementaries with the dual immersion and two and three section schools. Um, I, I hesitate to give you a firm answer, but do I think it can be done in a year? I, I, yeah, I do. In addition, students that attend that would switch, say, from Roosevelt to Sam Davey uh, would enter in sixth grade there. And so the first students to be affected by a potential difference in the middle school that they might have gone to before this plan went into place would actually not be for three years until they enter ninth grade. So there is some buffer room. You know, I think the committee likes to try to make decisions as soon as possible to give families enough time to adjust to whatever changes might be made. But there, it's not as though those students would need to know. Nope, I think I've got that backwards. So maybe I want to walk that back. Nope, they would probably only have one year. So I take that back. But the, the so excuse me, and I know the, I can see Ben nodding out there because he knew as soon as I opened my mouth that I was on the wrong track with that. But um, the, I'm sure that the committee would be very interested in you know, getting that out quickly. We want to make changes and make decisions so that parents and families can adjust to them and have as long as they can to prepare. One of the emails we received just within the past 24 to 48 hours um, in thinking about the question of middle school boundaries, uh, the person uh, questioned many families would have the uncertainty of where their students attend middle school and may even have children at two different middle schools. Um, and could you clarify, and I think there, there could be um, uh, I, it wasn't entirely clear to me, but two scenarios where either the children are close in age that they would be at middle school right. together or right. separated in age. So administratively, um, I can speak a little bit to that. Our goal is, is to keep families together. So if, if you look at um, the work that you did with the memorial transition, um, we have families that live in the new North High School boundary areas that attend Memorial because they still have an older sibling there. So we're really um, committed to keeping families together. Those are some of the details um, that we'll want to look at and we'll want to sort out as a committee um, to see, you know, what that would look like and, and what it would mean for the families um, that are impacted. I also hear um, things like, um, if I have um, an incoming student this year, um, and then I know the following year they're going to change schools, do they go to a school for one year and then transition? Um, those are the sorts of questions that I think families are waiting to have an answer for. And um, one of the reasons that we really want to have that year um, to help families to transition to, to be able to answer some of those questions. I think they weigh heavy on families' minds.
Well, <clears throat> thanks for the update, and thanks too for, uh, I mean, it's a reminder of how many years of work uh, you and other committee members have put in and uh, working on this very, what are often controversial decisions. And I also want to say thank you to the, the parents and families who have attended um, these listening sessions and attended tonight to speak up on behalf of um, our public schools and something they care about deeply. And it's, and it's a testament that we're doing something right, I think, um, that we have this kind of enthusiasm and concern. Um, I, there is a, the, the, there was reference in some of the public comment to community proposal 2.0 and um, not being a demographics and trans expert, I'm, I'm not sure I grasp every nuance of this, but um, I gather that the, it's really around the, the notion of flexible boundaries for Roosevelt and Sherman, minimizing the disruption in the north side. Um, something, a difference between something like 275 students versus 20 students being displaced in this case. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that. Can, can we speak to that a little bit? Um, at the last uh, presentation, I spoke to uh, 1.0. Have I seen 2.0? Did I get it, Kelly? No. So I can't speak to, to 1.0. I know that the committee um, and their thoughts about the first uh, presentation were the concerns that um, were created by workload, um, individually adding um, that flexible boundary to each house real estate assessment the um, the cost of busing, which was six figures, uh, in addition to um, a lot of concern from the committee that what it was doing was just kicking the can. It moved 20, 30 students, opened up a lot of flexible boundaries, and it did achieve um, fewer students being moved. It did do that. Um, but at the, ulti at the end of the day, the committee looked at both proposals and thought that the better one to bring forward to the board um, was the one that you have in front of you. Um, it's, it, it was a good proposal. And would you say that's, it's sort of, I've, I sense this is, the community proposal is very conservative in it, what it's trying to do in terms of maintaining the status quo, uh, the committee feels it's important to act uh, and, and act on the, the information we have and, and the, what, what the committee has studied and found. Is so, that fair to characterize it that way? I think so. And one of the things I, I heard Kelly say today was um, if you look at that light blue section near the top, you can see the river um, about halfway through. And Kelly, is that right that the, would it be the west side of the river would go to Sherman? Okay, um, so the west side of the river, kind of where the S is up there for Sam Davey, um, that would go to Sherman um, rather than moving um, over to Sam Davey. Um, the, from a demographic trends planning um, perspective, one of the challenges is the area of the district that is most under capacity is actually on the other side of the river. Um, so it does offer some relief for Roosevelt, but the idea of smoothing out enrollment across the district um, is a little bit um, a little bit trickier. So the purple area there is Locust Lane, and that's an area that's been under capacity. Um, Longfellow has traditionally been under capacity, but um, dual immersion um, should help us with that. So um, if you go um, to the left, if you go counterclockwise from that light blue section, um, Sherman is a, a growing area and has, um, it has some room, it's comfortable. I think right now it's at about 75%, um, but it also has an expansion on it. Um, it was a referendum school um, a handful of years ago. Uh, Lakeshore is an area that's you know, on the radar for one that, that's fairly crowded. And then if you kept going counterclockwise, you'd run into Putnam Heights, um, you'd run into Manns, and those are areas that were flagged as um, above 90% capacity. So the rotation, ideally, from, in, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, demo and trends folks, but um, ideally the rotation was clockwise rather than counterclockwise to help smooth out enrollments. So 
So again, uh, some questions coming in as recently as uh, within the last 24 to 48 hours from people. If you could clarify, please. When you said for implementation in 2021, the questions coming from community members, is this implementation date, is it effective for everyone? If you could clarify that. In other words, can it start, is it going to start with the incoming kindergarten class of 2021? It's one of the questions. Um, is there any sort of grandfathering? Are students going, current students, are they going to be able to finish out their elementary careers at Roosevelt? And, and those are some of the questions that w once a decision is made that the, both the committee and administration could work through. Um, but at this point in time, we don't have those answers. We know that there are questions that are floating out there, um, but don't have the answers. I, I actually think that the committee has uh, committed several times that um, one of the real reasons that they decided to bring this particular um, plan forward, even though it does move you know, 250, 275 kids, it's a little hard to tell because we're working with current numbers and of course we don't know how many, we only know how so many, but it will move a significant number of kids, um, was because that committee has come to believe that the, the state of crowding at Roosevelt and Lakeshore in particular is actively harmful to students. They're receiving, you know, um, under the new plan, Roosevelt would go to 79% capacity. That would actually reduce their average class size by four students uh, from fractionally under 25 to fractionally under 21. Uh, and the committee has over and over said that if those students are not being as equitably served, if those students are not getting the same access, they have, you know, 0.8 of specialists because of being a two-section school, but there are more students for those if, than if they had a lower capacity rate. And if that's the case, then we should stop that harm as soon as possible. So the committee has felt all along that, and that's why the recommendation is here for 2020, 2021, because that was as soon as we could have that particular thing lay off. The community plan um, does, uh, and Kim brought up some of the reasons. I think. Adding 90 students to Sherman would put them really at nine. What is, what's the current population of Sherman, Kim? You look like you have that sheet there. I do. Um, if we added 90, that would go up about 20%. There Correct. Are, and they're at what percentage now? 75? Um, they're at 75. Um, it wouldn't right, go up 20%. So, it would go right, up about 15 But 15 percent. puts them at 90. Right. 90%. So in any event, the community plan offered a grandfathering, saying, well, we would just let all of the Roosevelt students in the the you know area west of the river there uh, continue through and I can't fully speak for the whole committee but the committee has now three times affirmed that they want this to happen um, for students now and that it's helping that it hurts students and there we agree that there is going to be some stress on families that that move and that that will not be insignificant and that students will be affected by that but the committee has over and over again said we think that the, the harm done to every student at Roosevelt, that fractional harm every day of being in a crowded place, is greater than the harm of moving uh, the 275 students. And the reason that they opted to do the whole seven schools was so that hopefully that puts everybody, as you can see, um, you know, down below 80, and so that growth on the north side will give us a longer time before we have to address these issues again and cause potentially that same move of other students um, and I think it really comes down to you know some of our community members don't feel that that harm is equal that the harm of moving students is greater and that's a reasonable thing to to believe in and that they've been a fantastic group of advocates and I know they haven't agreed with me maybe at all throughout the process but we've been able to talk about ideas um, but if the board feels that way then the best answer is just to continue the status quo because then nobody has to move and the, if the harm is not there I for one you know, I've worked on this committee and I did not vote in the in the most recent vote to bring this forward because it was unsure my status as a board member where I fit in the committee at this point um, but I had voted on previous ones um, because I think that reducing those class sizes and you know, all of the research shows that smaller class sizes help students and the students that are helped the most are those that are disadvantaged, uh, both socioeconomically, students of color, all of these groups are helped. And I'm, so the committee, I think that their intention, and Phil, maybe you can 
if I'm not correct, please say so, but I think the committee has said over and over again, we want it to start for everybody. We know that it moves kids right away, but it gets, it opens up more air for students to breathe at that time. No, that, that was a concern. Transportation was a concern. Access to services equitably was a concern. And then there's just, there's the resource implications. Uh, in the original recommendation, we were talking about a 20 million addition to a two-section school to make it a three-section school surrounded by a couple of schools that were at 50%. At the same time, in, in on the south side of the city, there's 95% um, over capacity at at least two of the elementary schools and um, when we visited uh, um, oh my gosh um, Prairie Ridge just had a when we visited Prairie Ridge uh, we we noted the uh, the over the overcrowding there as well and the growing need for 4k across the city so when you have um, facilities that are half full in one part of the, of, of the city and you know that you need facilities very badly in another, uh, you know, Kelly, Kelly asked a very pertinent question about referendum and, and if, you, if you are going to pass a referendum, can you actually do that with a, with a building that's only half full? Um, that doesn't only apply to being able to put that in a 4K uh, facility. I think, it, I think it applies across the board of what are you doing with that with that resource. Um, I just want to, uh, I guess, talk through our process as a board. Um, and I guess it's more a question for the board members. When, um, you know, in my time on the board, four years, we've had one vote like this where we've changed boundaries, okay? And the one that we did was the, obviously, the high school boundary change. September 2017, when we made that vote. When we made that vote at that time, it's actually a rather long motion. It was to implement the boundary change. It had the start date. It had a list of students currently attending. The school will be allowed to remain until they graduate um, or if they choose to leave. You know, allowing students to continue to attend if they have concurrent enrollment. Um, provide. Uh, and then it provided that transportation for that three-year buffer when there were dual transportation. So when that vote was taken, though, in September 2017 by the board to move forward with the boundary change with an established time frame, it had those other pieces as a part of the motion. So I'm, and what's being, I guess, brought tonight is, is, diff, is a little different from that because they want us to vote on just one piece of it and leave the rest for later. My sense, I'm not sure. I there's a part of me that feels that um, it, it, I think that a decision like this is a very difficult decision for the community, no matter what decision you make. But I think that one of the things that helps is for people to know up or down uh, where they stand and to not have ambiguity. Um, I, I think that it's inevitable that people will be upset with, with, there will be a contingency that will be upset with something that we do. But I think that on our end, we can make sure that there is as little ambiguity as possible regarding where you sit. So um, I guess that's my question for the board tonight, is do we feel that there should be a full motion like that motion with the high school change, where it basically the vote outlines each and every one of those things? going into it, going into that decision. And if so, is that something that we're prepared to do tonight, to hash out those details tonight, or would we need to wait till the next meeting? Those, those are kind of my questions for the board to consider, I guess, as we talk about this. I, I see it, this package compared to the 2017 package are very similar. The only difference is that we don't have the detail for the second package. But what is the same is that we establish parameter and value priority that the committee can only make recommendation based on those parameter. And those parameter, we would need to um, vote with the understanding that a few glitch need to be fixed so that is uh, conducive to the few that are still 
having a hard time knowing or adjusting, but knowing that the district will do its best to fix those fields overall the main uh, the, the, the bigger picture for the district will be resolved. And I recall when we decided in 2017, we made a very, very bold decision, uh, a decision that no one wants to touch for a long, long time. But we err in the idea that the benefit for the district is um, needed to make improvement for the whole district. So I, I would hope that if you vote tonight, that the district would follow through with similar package that we did in 2017, but with the trust that that will take place if you were to rush for a decision tonight. Does your committee meet regularly in the summer months? Yes. Is there a... Um I mean, there is some breathing room to make the decision. We're targeting 2020 slash 21, correct? Uh, I don't know how much time. Is there a kind of a work back schedule you have in mind if that, that we have to keep to? Our, our goal was for a year to transition families. Yeah. Um, my, my other wondering is, um, is I understand the questions that you're asking, um, and I think that they're important. Is do you want that work done at the committee level, or do you want administration to look at those questions and the numbers and make a recommendation? I can chime in certainly. If you I, I when my question I can say uh, was really just about the urgency of. Okay. Voting tonight versus at a later meeting, and I, I have a sense that there's not much urgency for this month versus next month. It's not going to make a, an enormous difference, but I mean, correct me if I'm if you have a different perspective. I don't know. I don't know that I would call it urgent. Although I would say that um, I think that if if you are a family impacted by the decision. Yes. Um, it's hard to wait. Yes. It's hard to guess. Yeah. And I, but I think it could always go back to the point of waiting then mm -hmm. for one decision and now waiting for the next yeah. several that, that, that accompany it, as, as uh, Commissioner Lugan pointed out, I think is a concern. I, I think that um, having some idea of direction, doesn't it allow for the two to three million for the, the work that would be done on Roosevelt? Is that a summer project? Not this. No. Is it is it possible? I'm wondering as far as the structural issues of Ro Roosevelt needs. I mean, I would I would I don't need any more time to contemplate that piece. I would say, I mean, as far as what I would support, I would support issuing debt as a board for that full amount of the three million or whatever it is that they need for deferred maintenance and a security system, and putting that on a board agenda, following the state law process to issue debt for that and um, the public hearing process that entails and move forward with that. Um, I don't know if that requires a motion at this point or if that would wait for a later day, um, but that's certainly one area that I would feel we could perhaps make a decision on. So one of the things I would recommend is that you get a report from Abby about what it would mean to issue debt and what right. the parameters are rather than trying to do that at this particular meeting. Right. I think it's you could do it as an individually considered item, but I would um, I would recommend that, that you have all the information for all the board members as some board members have not gone through the process of issuing debt. Right. Yeah, and I want to be cognizant too that we, you know, we have five of the seven for the really important topic tonight. Um, so yeah, I do, I do feel it would be good to have follow up on that piece. Um, and as far as as far as what you're asking, uh, Mr. Lyons, regarding some direction, knowing where knowing where this sits tonight, as you take things to your committee, um, if you were to do that, I think that. To reference the motion from September 25th, 2017, in board docs, because it it was it basically um, one, two, three, four, five. It was five core decisions that the board made. 
from all the way from implement the boundary change effect of this day to everything else logistically that 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 included so um, I don't I don't recall the specifics of who made recommendations to us uh, prior to this but I do remember I do remember that demo trends weighed in on those matters and said you know we recommend concurrent enrollment or we recommend XYZ um, and some of the recommendations the board went with and some they did not go with I recall um, but at the very least the board had the awareness of on these particular areas this is where the committee felt but yeah it was the September 25th 2017 um, I, f I, I do feel I I feel very thankful for the many many people who have engaged with our district up to this point not only with the committee but people who've come to our listening sessions I know this is an incredibly emotional and challenging topic and um, even more so when it's stretched out even more so when it's your own neighborhood your own children the teachers that you love the staff that you love but um, I also feel that I um, we can uh, mitigate many other future potential challenges if we go forward with the decision with complete and total clarity on all fronts you know we can do that that's at least my take I guess. so uh, as a point of clarification um, would the board um, direct that the parameters for setting boundaries and for transitioning families follow the guidelines that um, the board approved with the high school boundaries uh, because if that were to happen if those values were to be in place and those parameters were to be in place then you could move forward with your um, you know your decision if you wanted to see what those recommendations would look like then you would have to wait till the July meeting to to make your decision well I guess one of the aspects of it is they were they're very clear guidelines and standards that the board set then and I think that most all of them at least my, with my read on it most of them would could apply in this situation but I just don't know if perhaps with elementary level if there are some things that would be different um, I I don't know but I, I think that would be the piece that Is there any, any further discussion or other questions? <clears throat> Just briefly, I mean, I, th I do think the, the the principle behind this is important, and Commissioner Vu, I think I heard you speak to that as well. The, the idea, of what is what principle is driving this, and uh, Commissioner Nardin talked to it as well. This is the idea of, I think, uh, what doing the, the most good and the least harm and kind of a, a, a combination of those things and trying to, to f it, we know that this is not an, moving students is never an ideal situation. Um, and so there's some implicit harm there, but there's also some implicit good here in this balancing that's, that's pretty important. And um, I, I think we, as a board, we need at least to resolve that and speak clearly about where we stand on that point. Uh, personally, I'm. I'm moved by the idea that uh, there's a reason that we pay attention to percentages and there's a reason that uh, Demo and Trends has been looking at these percentages for so many years and that's because it matters. It matters to the service that we're providing to our students in this district. And it's part of the, the trade-off we, this may be part of the trade-off we, we need to make to, to do the overall the best good. So um, <clears throat> to me, I think having just that clarity of statement, if we can as a board, helpful as framing for this and we prop I'm sure we will not get complete agreement on, a, on whatever direction we go for but if we can at least be stating the principle it's a good thing so, a recommendation has been made um, regarding elementary school boundaries and the board is now charged with acting on that um, we have a number of options one option, uh, we could vote on the committee recommendation as presented. We could vote on the committee recommendation 
and ask that uh, they also return with recommendations that parallel those of the 2017 action for the high school boundaries. We could vote for a recommendation other than the one presented by the committee. Uh, we could vote to send uh, this project back to the committee for further work. I think if we were to go in that direction, they would need very specific guidance from us as to what that work would need to be. I can make a motion to start. Uh, so I would move that um, this proposal be sent back to the Demographic Trends and Facility Planning Committee um, to be revised um, uh, to the best of its ability to mirror that 2017 uh, outline uh, regarding e each of those areas and to be brought back to the board in July as an individually considered resolution. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Uh, any further discussion? I just think it's not, I, I said this at a previous meeting as well, I don't know that it's fair to the families that have waited since October, which was the first time I believe that Demographics and Trends brought this, to make them wait another six weeks for another maybe this is when the decision is going to be made. Uh, if I understood Commissioner Vu's comments correctly, I think we have the principles in place to make uh, the adjustment for middle school going forward and I think just about everything else that was read off of that list is, is in the proposal as it stands. Um, so I, I don't think that the way that I would vote on this proposal will necessarily make Roosevelt families that have been so passionate about this happy but I think even if I'm not going to make them happy, I think we owe them their Monday nights back so they can at least know what's going on one way or the other. Um, so I'm not going to support this. It's not that I don't think that those questions need to be answered, but I think that they need an answer on this step not six weeks from now. I guess I'll just speak to the counterpoint. And I, and I, I, I totally um, understand where you're coming from, particularly as someone who's been on this committee for such a long time. Um, my take is that it actually, perhaps in the long run, would be in the best interest of the families who've been waiting this long to wait a little bit longer. Um, and perhaps they won't see that over the next couple of weeks, but I think time would show that um, having a decision made by the board that's a full decision with all of the details laid out as was done in 2017 would help to um, level things out. And that's just my perspective, but also knowing how um, the decision was made in 2017 and the specificity that it had and the, 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 um, the depths that our staff went to to communicate about it and communicate about each of those details, I think that that helped greatly to mitigate what could have been, a, I think, an, an even more contentious issue. So that's, I guess, my perspective. Further discussion? Oh, there is a motion on the table. And is it appropriate um, to do a voice vote? Or it is? Okay. Uh, so those in favor of the motion to send the proposal back to the committee to be revisited, um, to be revised to mirror the action taken in 2017 for the high school boundaries to be brought back to the full school board at our July meeting. Uh, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Nay. Uh, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. Commissioner Bika, could you clarify the the ayes and the nays? I I heard you say nays, but I didn't know if you voted no. I voted no. So we now adjourn to committee for reports to the board. And after each report, there'll be an opportunity for members of the audience to ask questions and or request clarification. And that said, uh, anyone wishing to share their support for an item 
or to provide an opposing view should sign up to participate in the public forum time at the next regular board meeting. So the first committee report is 9.1, uh, the committee promote proposal for inclement weather makeup days. And this is Ms. Marks. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so, gotta make sure I have the right button. Um, tonight we're going to review some work that the calendar committee did related to um, identifying and prioritizing emergency school closure potentials for the already approved 1920 school calendar. Um, it's frightening that we're already talking about emergency school closures when it finally started to get warm and the sun was shining. Um, so, but just to give you a little bit of background, in the current calendar for next school year, um, we have a calendar that's in place that's been approved, and uh, if you look at the slide in front of you, you can see that we have, um, based upon each level, we already have built-in days to accommodate for emergency school closures. So on the grid, you can see that just based on the daily schedule that exists at each of the levels, um, there is um, an excess of minutes at each level based upon the schedule that exists. So at the elementary, there's based on the already established um, minutes in the, cell, in the, in the uh, daily schedule, we have 9.8 days. At the middle school, we have 3.8. And at the high school, we have 4.06 days. In the current calendar, we also have one calendar pullback day, which exists, which is April 13th, and that exists for all levels. And so if you add those up, that gives you an excess of 10.8, 4.8, and 5.06. So that's what's currently in the calendar. And when we created the new calendar in the district, we thought that we were um, some pretty important folks that we <laughs> took the ability and had the foresight to embed so many additional days based upon one year where I think that we had maybe four inclement weather days, which was unique um, in the seven years that um, Dr. Hardebeck and I have both been here. And we thought, well, we can't have this. Even on an average, I think it's usually maybe three but at that point in time, um, it was, nope, we need to have about five built in. And so that's where this came from. And other districts around us were like, you guys, what are you doing over in Eau Claire having so many days built in? You don't need all that. And then this past year, they were like, wow, even Eau Claire doesn't have enough days built in. Um, so this past year was a little unique for everybody. But in the current calendar, this is what we have built in. And obviously, the difference between each level has to do with what's required by DPI. So. Um, that would be the difference in the days. Uh, we pulled the calendar committee together um, to talk about how can we be a little bit more proactive so that we're not um, reacting in the event that we should have a repeat of this past year. So there was a charge to the calendar committee to look at it increasing the amount of time for the secondary level only because of the chart you just saw um, and to look at how we can um, potentially increase um, some time at that level. So you can see that We've already talked about this, the um, secondary levels. Um, there's a difference of uh, 3.8 days if we just looked at the daily schedule and 4.06 days if we just looked at the daily schedule. And again, that didn't include the pullback days. So the calendar committee was charged at looking at ways that we could um, increase that at their level. So there are several different options that they had to consider. Um, the first one was looking at pre-identifying in the current uh, schedule for 1920, days that could be pulled back and utilized as student instructional days um, after what, what, what the already pre-existing days that are identified, once those were already utilized, um, then looking at other days that could be pulled back and identified um, on a priority listing that we would use as an on, in an on, we could use as an as needed basis, there you go. Um, so that was option A, was to just identify those in advance so that we weren't doing what we had to do this year, which was responding to everything. So this would be a little bit more proactive. 
Option B was uh, to establish some benchmarks uh, throughout the calendar and say at this point in time we'll look to see where we're at with any emergency school closures that have already occurred and where we're at in terms of um, our bucket of reserve that we have for that and determine if at this point in time we're already so far into our excess days that we should look at um, adding some minutes into the secondary level similar to what we did this year. And if we did that, that it would be set um, in this option to say that we're going to have benchmarks at certain points in time. And if we do this, here's what that um, bell schedule is going to look like, and here's when it will go into effect. So there won't be any question as to what students and parents, um, as well as staff, could anticipate at those periods of time. So it would be much more proactive, and everybody would understand at these points in time, we'll evaluate where we're at. And if the need exists, this is excuse me, this is what will happen. Option C was identifying now basically that same thing that we just talked about in option B. So rather than doing it at benchmarks in time, we would just say right now we're going to add seven minutes to the secondary bell schedule. Um, and then what that would do is give us the additional emergency school closure days at the middle level of uh, 2.89 an additional at the high school level of 2.92, which then gives you those totals you see there of 6.69 and 6.89. So option B and C are similar, it's just a timing of when that would happen. And then option D was any combination that the committee could come up with regarding A through C. So those were what we considered. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about what committee members heard from colleagues, from families, from students. Um, we had some in-depth discussion with the administration at the secondary levels and how this past year had affected things within their buildings. Um, and so basically just summarizing that discussion, um, it came down to evaluating how whatever we do affects student instruction. Um, and that piece really had to do with the amount of feedback that um, at least the people around the table were sharing that they heard um, that when, when we added seven minutes a day, that the instructional value of that was very minimal. That that's what they were hearing was, you know, seven minutes a day, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make up for missing 11 and a half days of school. Um, so that came through um, very concretely in the conversations we had. There was also a lot of conversation about the importance of the calendar that we do have and the professional development and instructional planning days and how much planning actually goes into creating those days and the work of the district is so embedded into what happens on those days and this year when all of that was just kind of pulled out from underneath us without much notice everything just halted and none of that planning and movement of how we work to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to educate students that that just all stopped and there was no way to gain that back this year and so that, that'll require time in the summer or pushing things off until next year um, because there's no way to make up that time so there I mean we created the schedule for a reason and that's very important time for our staff members and um, it was disappointing on their end to know that that piece just vanished um, because a lot of very important work happens on those days and it was just gone. Um, so that was a lot of conversation as well as the just the fact that we're here having um, the conversation about the need to be proactive in our communication. So the fact that we're bringing this to the board and saying here's a recommendation so that staff, students, and parents aren't wondering what will happen if we should have to relive what occurred last winter. Um, people will know in advance what that plan will be. And then again, just recognizing that last winter was really very unique and hopefully we'll never have to go through that again. And so making sure we're not throwing what they would call the baby out with the bathwater and overreacting and creating a system that's hopefully never going to have to be relived again, but also recognizing that there are things we could do that would even if it doesn't come to that, it would still be very helpful for everybody if we had some pieces in place. So the recommendation um, <clears throat> from the committee was um, that we would look to maintain the current April 13th pullback, pullback day 
uh, that we would add a May 22nd as a pullback day if needed and that we would add June 8th, 9th, and 10th as makeup days if needed. Um, that final bullet, um, it, uh, it doesn't do what we've prided ourselves on for the past couple of years of having a, having a very hard stop for parents and families so that they know this is when the school year is going to end. That was always something that we heard through the parent engagement survey as well as at um, the Parent Advisory Council. So that's a piece that we've really worked hard to be able to maintain. The conversation at the committee level was if parents know in advance that if we run out of days and we have to go into that week of June, that there's a potential that school isn't going to end on the 5th, and it could go into the following week and it could go as far as the actual 10th of June that it's not a concrete hard stop but at least they know that there's the potential that it could go to the 10th if if things got as unique as what they were this past year so what that looks like um, changing the first grid to this grid would be you still have your daily schedule that builds in the excess you still have the current pullback day of April 13th. There's an additional recommended pullback day of May 22nd. And then there's the recommended modification of the three days in June, the 8th, 9th, and 10th, which then gives your emergency school closure day totals uh, in the final column on the right. So it would be the 14.8 for elementary, 8.8 8 for middle, and then 9.06 for the high school. And so I have an actual, um, I can show you on the current um, calendar what that looks like. Okay, zoom, zoom, Ooh, wrong way. So this is the current calendar, which the board approved. And April 13th is the current pullback day. Um, and so, you can see no school for students, um, and it's a potential inclement weather makeup day for all, for all students. So it's blue in that it would normally be a, a day that students aren't in session, and for just the purposes of the um, recommendation, we've color-coded it to share a color with also pink, being that as part of the recommendation from the committee, this would also be a day that we would keep um, as part of the recommendation so that we would keep that as a pullback day. Same thing exists for May 22nd. That would be a, another day that we would look at as a potential pullback day. Um, and then down in June, you can see that the 8th was set to be the last um, day for staff with students ending on the 5th. So if on the 8th we needed to go into this week the pink would indicate that it's a student makeup day for the potential 8th, the 9th, and the 10th. So then the 11th, if we needed to get to that point, would be the um, possible last day, of, last day for staff if we actually needed those days. So those kind of color codings with pink would be what the calendar would look like if um, the board were to accept the recommendation from the committee. So those, those are the modifications. And then you could see on that chart that I showed you previously how that gives us the excess days of the 14, 8, and 9, or 9 and 10. So. so one of the things that I asked the committee to do was to um, develop some type of predictability in the calendar. I'm hoping that we don't have another winter like we had last winter. Um, but we, prior to implementing this calendar, we did have two very, very cold winters where we had to close school because of uh, wind chill and uh, frigid cold. And that was, those were two years that we went well into June. Um, I, I think it's important for the board to, uh, to uh, recognize that uh, many, many parents do not like going into June. They make uh, plans uh, for June, and they do like that idea of a hard stop. Um, but 
it's also important to have some predictability and so that people aren't wondering what will happen because we've missed so many days. So as you make your decision, and I think that will be next time, um, you know, just kind of keep in mind that uh, we are just trying to provide some guidelines and some predictability in case we experience another winter like we did this winter. And hopefully we won't have to face that. Thank you for that presentation, I, I recall a lot of um, different suggestions from different people back in January and February. I believe one or two of them stick out strong in my mind, and I, I have not heard about that kind of possibility during this presentation. So I would hope that um, before we make a firm decision, we would look at more possibility, creative ideas, and one of those ideas was what about accommodating the transportation barriers? Because it was the bus fear, safety, that, that school would be closed for all. And then a suggestion came out that to accommodate that, perhaps um, school will continue but find ways that everybody can participate or majority can have the option to participate or not participate. I, I want to see more creative ideas other than traditional ideas. So I, I think, Commissioner View, what you're talking about or referencing both, I think at that point in time people were talking about um, kind of like online school or participating through technology and, and um, instead of having to make things up that's... So having, having parents drive students in? But at the same time, those that, that uh, do not wish to be in school are not penalized. I'm not sure that legally we can do that. Because we're required by law to, to make sure that students have a safe transportation to school. I mean, I could defer to my transportation colleagues and Kim and Abby from the legal standpoint and the, the money standpoint. but. I, I believe that we are we are required to make sure that we provide that transportation to students. So in times of inclement weather, parents always have the option to keep their students at home if we decide to hold school. And that's an excused absence. So we do have that option. Um, our concern is providing safe transportation for staff, for students, uh, making sure that if we are having an instructional day that all students have access to that instruction. So when we close school, it's with the idea that we create an equal playing field for all students. And that's a very important piece of whatever our plan is, is that if we were to do technology, we would have to ensure that all students had devices, that all teachers were uh, equipped to use any kind of instructional platform that we employed, um, that students had internet access at home. Um, so a lot of these um, questions and suggestions, although very creative and, and good suggestions, sometimes create barriers of equity for us. The other piece is that I, 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 I see that we are proposing ideas on pulling back, but I, I have not seen enough of how to make up. And I want to see more detail of that as an option. Um, so looking at the added days at the end of the school year, the 8th, 9th, 10th, would that mean that the that summer programming would presumably start on the 15th? Because we wouldn't really know until well into the spring, whether or not we would need the 8th, 9th, and 10th? We, even before this became an issue, when we looked at the summer school for next year, this was several months ago, even before all the snow days, we knew we were not going to start until the 15th anyway. Okay. Um, typically, summer for us is a three-week session, and then we have a one dead week uh, during 4th of July. Then there's two subsequent three-week sessions, so it goes three, one, three, three. Because of the way the 4th of July landed this coming year, it'll be on a Saturday, um, the need for the 
the, the down week doesn't really exist. Also, with teachers getting done on the 8th, um, to be able to, you couldn't really start summer school with a full week that week anyway, so to be able to transition, we had planned all along for starting on the 15th. So this wouldn't have any effect no. on no. Okay, thank you. Did the uh, committee talk through with the January 20th? That one, it looks like it's only staff and it isn't doesn't have the option of being a makeup day. What was the, where was the committee on that one? With January 20th not being able to be a makeup possibly? Um, that we, the reason that we target it further down in the year is because usually by January 20th, we, we haven't run out of the already built in five days. Like we haven't gotten to a point where we're looking at a sixth day that's needed by January 20th. So yes, we did talk about that and we're like, oh, if it's really bad, but I mean, yeah, we, we uh, usually aren't, aren't looking at that at that early stage. If it gets really bad next year, Kay, I'm gonna, no, I'm just <laughs> You're gonna be like, hey, I, I told no. you. And I'll be like, Joe, you knew. Yep. Can I, can I make a comment about that? That's also a work day for secondary. That's this, uh, the time between first and second semester, so it's not a PDIP day. I, so I just wanted to clarify, there is no um, proposed change to the bell schedule for this plan for the coming year? Correct. Also, just to clarify, the ideas for moving in a direction of on some form of online or hybrid instruction, was that considered and rejected by the committee or not considered? No, we didn't talk about that at the committee because I think, um, I think at a, a higher level, we've, we had those conversations back when we were going through all of this and the, the suggestions were made and similar to the things that Dr. Hardebeck has already talked about. Um, there were so many barriers that existed with it at that point in time that at a district level we didn't think that we're at a point for next year to be able to say this is something that we could have in place. So when I, excuse me, when I um, laid out different options for the committee to discuss that were feasible to roll out for next year, that wasn't one of the options. So we do have an online platform uh, called Canvas, and um, about half of our schools are using Canvas to the full implementation. However, because of some of our full plate issues, we have left those options up to uh, individual schools. So until all schools came onto Canvas, we would not be able to provide that kind of online instruction for all of our schools. And then we would still face the idea of internet access um, devices, um, training, that kind of thing. So it's possible that in a couple of years we could implement some type of technology instead of using makeup days, but we're not at the capacity level where we can do that this year. Just had one other question. I may have missed this. Uh, this is related to student transit specifically in adding or changing um, school uh, start or end times, uh, do we have the ability to change the end time rather than the start time? And of course, I'm speaking specifically to I, you know, the, the problem with earlier start times, especially mm -hmm. for secondary students. So in terms of like either adding minutes on and adding to the end of the day? Mm -hmm. So yep, Kim, go ahead. I can speak to that. Um, we would not be able to add to the end of the secondary day without shifting elementary hours um, because um, our bus drivers usually drive at least two routes, if not three. So they start secondary, often move then to elementary and sometimes then follow up with Prairie Ridge. So if we were to add seven minutes to the end of the secondary day, we would need to shift all elementary routes or all actually all elementary bell schedules. And that would also require us to shift um, Prairie Ridge, which already is quite late. Some of those children don't get off the bus until 5.30ish. Um, so we would be shifting them more, we need just a little closer to their bedtime.
sorry, do you feel as though the committee would be ready for us to consider this at the July meeting? Mm -hmm. I do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next report, uh, 9.2, progress update on English language arts review. Good evening. <clears throat> so we are going to give you an update. Uh, I believe we updated you at this time last summer on how the English Language Arts Review, also known as Literacy Within Supportive Learning Environments, uh, have been progressing. So uh, this, this, uh, the goal of this presentation is to review the purpose of that project, um, how the implementation is going, and then also um, outline the next steps. So we, um, the work is really uh, centers around the two, two of the three board goals. Um, the first one, and if we look at the strategic plan, which really um, encompasses um, the part of the strategic plan encompassed by goal number one, which is that articulate and align um, a rigorous, uh, culturally relevant and engaging curriculum pre-K through 12. Um, but also the, the, the term literacy within supportive learning environments, um, the board language for the strategic plan specifically mentions uh, maintain a safe and supportive learning environment, which has been something that we recognize that we don't teach content in isolation that we've created with a lot of structures that support student learning. So um, this project is, is uh, entering its third year. Um, it is all the steps, in, in, and especially with, um, uh, as identified in the, in the second um, goal there, the part about being research-based practices is all this is founded on research, and we made this list of the different uh, people that we have pulled research from, uh, ranging from, I mean, there's a uh, Hattie Marzano, um, Shiraki Holly, the Wisconsin RTI Center, the Education Advisory Board, which is a superintendent's um, consortium to work on uh, leadership issues in education. So we really have done a heavy lifting and trying to make sure that the work we're doing is not done um, just, just on, a, on a whim. It's really done with uh, purposeful planning around the research. So there's a little bit of history too on the, um, the steps of the, of the work. Several years ago, before the strategic plan was written, um, there was a systems assessment done and really identified the fact that the district's programming was not articulated and really said it was time for the district to have a, a much more articulated program pre-K through 12. The strategic plan reflects that in its language. And then um, with that in the strategic plan, um, there was an external review. We had a, we had a, a partner work with us on reviewing our overall program and provided um, several recommendations uh, to the district in terms of its English language arts program, uh, which is, includes reading, writing, speaking, listening. And then finally, we've had some lead teams, uh, which involving a variety of stakeholders, helping us review that data and, and creating recommendations for the work moving forward. And that really is, um, and you've seen this document before, um, looking at the district's multi-level system of support and really looking, um, this work is really focusing around um, this first universal tier of instruction um, and looking at collaboration, the guaranteed and viable curriculum, the instruction that uh, accompanies that, the assessment system that uh, monitors our progress in the family engagement. And a multi-level system of support is really, um, what falls on these four major foundations. And just to give you an example of how this fits, um, I did a little bit of thinking about um, like organizational structures. So in other words, one of the structures is creating time containers in the school in the master schedule for the work to take place I mean it's very simple seems obvious but if you don't create those a master schedule with the appropriate time embedded and we're going to talk a little bit more of that later because we're going to be even more explicit about those structures so that we ensure um, the phase the phase two the reading work um, uh, actually takes place for our students um, but when I looked at something like um, we tend to focus often on the strong share leadership. So for example, those committees that help do this work, um, these were not individual, um, these are not decisions made by individual people, but through uh, several committee um, meetings. Um, and so finally down the bottom, the family community partnerships. And when I think about the English language arts um, program, um, when I looked at, uh, we did a variety of work trying to create definitions around family and community partnerships. And part of it is, is um, respect for the culture of our families. 
So making sure that the programming and the materials we use reflect the, the families that um, are represented in our schools. Um, it also talks about um, partnering with our families in terms of, um, and, and we're getting um, on the data analysis um, and, and looking at having families involved in um, helping guide our school improvement process. Um, and that includes, because one of our four goals is in each building in school improvement is always literacy, so that includes that component. Um, extending beyond the boundaries of our schools so is another part of our family and community partnership. So for example, we collaborate with UW Eau Claire um, and we have a program that's funded through our Title I programming with um, reading tutors. Um, Jane Rockwell's um, project that has students from the university um, coming into our schools and working with students after school. So we have a variety of opportunities to try to bring this to life through this project. So in a, the attempt to try to bridge this gap, these were, as we worked on our, our action plan for the literacy work, um, we really looked around these five steps. And so one of them um, is to align that curriculum uh, within supportive learning environments. And I'm gonna show you an example that looks like in a, in a few minutes about what an alignment process looks like. Um, it also is about creating a resource center. And I am going to try popping out of here real quick and show you, so rather than just say that, the a resource center um, is a, is a, in, in the um, electronic world, um, it's really creating a, a space for our staff to go to, to get the resources they need to run, um, to run their classrooms. And so, oh, good gravy. Um, I am not gonna, I was gonna give you a shot, but you're gonna have to, <laughs> sorry, it was gonna make me log in. I should have uh, run that before. Um, but basically we have created, if you go into um, the, um, our, our SharePoint site, and if you're a teacher, so if you're a first grade teacher, you go in there and in there is all the materials you need to run the program. There's pacing guides. Um, we have the, the curriculum guides. We have um, anchor charts, which I'll show you an example of in a moment. So we have all the documents there waiting for them uh, to be able to access, to be able to conduct their, the programming. Um, in terms of increasing knowledge sharing, um, we have done a great, we've, the, the work has been done primarily through the work of our principals and coaches. So, um, and that also gets in that improved administrative focus. So during our principal meetings, um, we'll bring in literacy coaches to work with their principals to, to identify, to help them um, realize what, what the content we want them to work on in their building is, but then they can develop that local implementation plan. So it becomes much more personalized to the needs in their building. And that last piece, that professional development then, has been delivered primarily at the building level. We're gonna have an exception to that next week, but this isn't being done where we bring everyone together. Um, it rarely is that the case. We're gonna have one event next week where that'll happen, but typically this is very building-based and gives the opportunity for a principal and a leadership team in collaboration with an instructional or, or literacy coach to be able to tailor that to the needs of the building. So the project, um, I think we were we were pretty confident in ourselves. We thought this would be about a three-year project. We got in the first year of the writing uh, work and the feedback we uh, received immediately was, um, we believe in the work, we want to do it well, but we need more time. And so we expanded phase one to be two years, and now phase two is gonna start getting into that reading piece. Um, we still have phase one at the secondary level taking place um, uh, uh, into the third year next year um, because they were didn't start at the same place that the elementary did. Um, and so phase two is gonna be um, really focusing around um, the, the items that you see highlighted, highlighted there in the second um, phase. So our phase one writing, just to bring it back on the work that's been done. So we determined essential and supporting standards for writing and grammar. That was one of the big outcomes. Um, we created anchor charts for each grade, uh, pre-K through college. And so Patty, how do I do this? Just wanna show you, yeah, can you please? So an example of an anchor chart, and, and if you head down to um, the other conference room, 123C, you will see something, uh, you'll see a bunch of these hanging up on the wall. And so um, this is an example of a second grade writers and narratives. So this clearly ar articulates what is expected at that grade level. And I'll tell you when we first did this work, um, we had a bunch of, uh, we, had, we saw some progressions and then we saw upper grade levels actually asking less of students than what was being done at um, younger grade levels give us an opportunity to recalibrate to make sure that we have this rising continuum um, throughout the district rather than um, the bumpy road where um, different levels are asking you know working in isolation so um, this is just a sample of that type of work and you can pop me back Patty, to the, thank you um, and we've done that in both in narrative opinion research writing inf informative writing and in our um, in our language conventions so 
Um, the professional development, as we mentioned, um, has been done um, on best practice and writing instructions, so we really focused this the last couple of years on volume, choice, modeling, and conferring. Um, I've heard those terms over and over again in the last uh, couple of years. Um, aligned, uh, we aligned the pre-K through um, 12 ELA writing units in narrative, informative, opinion, argument, and uh, research writing. And finally, strengthening that, the balanced assessment framework so that we really have multiple local measures. Um, I emphasize the word local um, because we're not waiting just for the state assessments to come in. We're developing local assessments. Um, Michelle Racky's team has done this amazing job of having data funnel f that, that we enter for student data into Skyward um, into a data warehouse and be able to have to be able to react to um, assessments on a much more timely basis than waiting for a forward exam to come back to us in the summer. Um, it's assessment data that's delivered by our staff so that they um, they're much close they're, they're tied much more closely to that work. So I talk about. Um, that articulation and also trying to identify the things that are critical and not. This isn't meant to shock and awe you with like vibrant colors here. Um, but basically, the idea here is that we've taken different standards. So this is a standard here, this is a standard here, this is a standard here, and we've mapped them. And the colors up here represent um, things that we're going to make sure to do, they're essential. Um, things, the lighter ones, things that are supportive, but they're not the, our priority. Um, and then, and so forth. Um, that. The dark purple is a standard that will receive extra emphasis. And so what we've done is we've taken the decision making of this off the plate of our staff and allow them to then dig into the work about how they can use their instructional skills to really bring this to life for their students. And so we have these maps in place um, throughout our programming, which has been a significant lift, but it really helps us that you can't do everything. And so we've had to identify some of the things that are not going to be priorities. So that gets us into phase two. So if we're, we're finishing up phase one, we must be then going to phase two, and that really emphasis is on reading. And um, I use the word emphasis here because really that focus on those early grades is um, learning to read. Um, and then there's this continuum, and we'll talk in just a little bit here about some of the, um, the national uh, reading panel and some of their recommendations. But um, this is an intentional curriculum um, and again, it's, this, we're talking about sound letter recognition, foundational skills, and word study in those earlier grades, um, and the systems that helps helps them uh, pronounce unknown, pronounce and read unknown words. And really, that's that phonics work, uh, work that's going to be a big focus for our our staff this um, coming up. And this is that training we're going to be develop or um, be delivering to our staff uh, next week. Um, that work had been part of the last curriculum. Um, but what we're doing is we're being much more explicit in terms of carving the, the, so instead of having teachers try to figure out where does this fit within my English language arts block, we're being much more um, prescriptive on you need to provide a certain amount of time so that this will actually take place. Um, and then there's reinforcement of these skills as students get older and really when you get into the upper grades, um, it's reinforcing those foundational skills and word study still happens. Um, so it's not like the, this, it's not going to keep, like end of third grade, and we just say, okay, we're done with that. Um, that type of work still goes on, but it has a different look to it, and we really start working on those comprehension, comprehension skills. Another way of looking at this is, um, and again, the, the National Reading Panel report, um, there are five areas of reading instruction, and, and the first one is phonemic awareness, um, and that ability to notice, uh, think about, um, and, and, um, and work with the individual sounds in spoken words. Um, that's part of that decoding. The second phase of that decoding is really the phonics. Um, it's teaching children that relationship between the letters um, of the written language and the individual sounds of the spoken language. And so there's a, there's a greater emphasis on that, but it doesn't go away as students um, move past that third grade, but the emphasis is really in those earlier grades. And then that fluency, the ability to read, so you know, be able to, to um, the difference between a choppy reader and a reader that is um, much more smooth, that can read with expression out loud, um, can read silently very smoothly. Um, and then progressing towards the vocabulary, the words that we, um, we want, to, that students need to know to be able to communicate. And finally, the real reason for reading is the, is the, um, is the text comprehension. You know, to be able to, again, um, derive knowledge from, um, by using your skills. So some of that to be in, in the group of, um, and I have to give some credit here to um, Barbara Goings and Lori House, um, two of our uh, um, academic services coordinators. They've coordinated our um, literacy and instructional coaches 
um, weekly um, over the past couple of months to develop maps for our teachers. And this is an example of one of those maps of what that foundational skills and work study will look like. And so you can see the major topics, and there's going to be no quiz on the details, but you can zoom in. But we have these maps now for every grade level. And really also other um, documents that help them talk about how that gets paced out over the course of the year. Um, this is a huge lift. Um, this actually did a couple things. One is the people that have to help implement this next year with the, to help um, uh, make this become a reality are our coaches in the buildings. And so those same people that are going to be doing that work with teachers um, in the buildings next year help build this. They also save the district lots of money because you can buy this stuff, um, but they had all the resources and tools um, to be able to put it together into a cohesive set of documents that they're going to deliver next week. So um, just you take the fiduciary responsibility of the district um, uh, had on. Um, they, just, uh, they did a lot of work rather than just going out and trying to purchase something. They did something that uh, much more has a local feel to it and um, is embraced uh, by all the coaches that have been working on it. And they've been just uh, working very, very hard at it. So some more pieces about the um, phase two reading. Um, so the, um, the essential standards, again, the same work that we did with writing will happen here as well, developing that map, that colorful map I showed you. Um, and then uh, the, the literacy coaches have also developed a K-8 scope and sequence uh, for those foundational word skills as I showed you that, what that map looks like. And then next week we're gonna have them for half of a day it's very unusual for us, but given that whole rearrangement of, um, with this, it's ironic that I'm coming up right after Kay was talking about the school closures. Um, by that rearrangement, we actually had the opportunity to um, push some of this work up and really do that um, on June 11th in the morning. We're going to have a, a like a, a full um, workshop setting for um, all of our elementary staff that are supporting English language arts. Uh, but it's only for a half day, and then the last two and a half days are going to be much more local with principals and literacy and instructional coaches um, working on the implementation, developing the skills that uh, they need to, the teachers need to um, utilize to implement um, the foundational skills, and then also giving them some planning time for next year to really help them spend some time going into the summer to really focus on um, preparing for this work coming in the fall. Um, and everything going back to that uh, multi-level systems of support um, if we think about thinking about everything from the time structures um, like when is this going to happen to the actual tools and skills that i need to utilize to make the the reading work um, be successful for our students this is another one of these documents that has a lot of text but is not meant to be a quiz for you all but just to give you an idea that um, there's different there's like a couple tracks going on we have district work taking place over these course of the year, um, these years, and then we have, this is what district teams are doing, and this is the impact on, and there's always a lag here, on what the um, teachers are doing. So you can see coming in next year, this focus on the foundational reading skills, and some of that work had already begun uh, uh, taking place in uh, um, this year, but you can see that that's gonna be the focus moving forward. So there is a map to this, um, we continue to modify that map based on feedback. So I believe um, Dr. Hardebeck's odometer is, is put on a lot of miles as she's chased around and visited with every leadership team and staff team to get feedback. Um, and we've modified this based on that. We've also modified it based on our professional development and feedback we've had through exit tickets from our staff to really give us some guidance as to the pacing of the, the work that's taking place. So, um, and, and the, the message we've gotten um, back from our staff is, um, there's a level of frustration um, as they work harder not seeing the needle move more in terms of having, having students be successful um, on the major assessments that of, of progress. And so we keep modifying this to make sure that we can um, have that professional development be at a timing that challenges our staff but also is supportive so that they can develop the skills to be successful. So coming this summer, um, this will be the, the work again of um, so this will be work done by teams in June and in August, um, developing those standards, um, identifying the key standards, the progressions, um, how we're going to um, do whole group instruction and small group instruction or individual support for students, and then we refine that as necessary. And then really looking at those resources so that that map, uh, which, I, um, which I was foiled at is showing you this evening, um, are in place for staff to be able to utilize. 
task. So part of the work, and you noticed earlier in the, um, in the presentation, I mentioned that there were a couple different teams. There was a, there was a literacy lead team, and then there was a culturally responsive uh, practices lead team. We actually merged those two projects because we really didn't want them to work in isolation of one another, and we just kept challenging ourselves to make sure the culturally responsive practices were embedded into the work that we were doing. And so to give you an idea a little bit of how that happens, we select um, texts that are and authors for classrooms, um, for the read-alouds, uh, for classroom libraries, for independent reading, um, so that, that are derived from um, the work of uh, a lot of um, leaders in this area, including um, locally. When we had the Circles of Change, the conversation kits, we utilize some of those resources as well, try to make sure that students can see themselves in the literature that they're working with. Um, and so we use these texts to help integrate that work. So to give you an example, um, we've got a few of them up here, and I just was going to make sure I can uh, articulate this well enough. The, um, the All Are Welcome text, to give you an example, um, this reinforces that school is a place where all students are welcome with open arms. Um, the separate is never equal um, is a story of Sylvia Mendez. Um, she's of Mexican and Puerto Rican heritage, and her family organized um, the Hispanic community to end an era of segregation education in California. Um, another text, and, and again, these are texts that our students have access to. Um, I am enough, which is filled with affirmations and messages of accepting and being kind to one another. And Dia's story cloth, which is the chronicle of stories of um, her aunt and uncle's emigration to the United States. So these are examples, and our libraries continue to grow um, in terms of making sure that, and, and um, I remember, so one of the things in addition that Lori did um, this year, she covered three buildings um, in terms of being, because uh, we couldn't find literacy coaches um, to fill those spots. And she reported back to us one day about one of the students who got so excited reading a text like this and saying, I, I can, for the first time I see myself in these books, it was really a neat story. Um, and so the difference that makes for students to be able to recognize themselves in the literature that they're reading um, makes a profound difference in terms of um, engaging them into the reading process. Um, so this has been um, a big lift for our team. I'm really proud of the work that they've done in this area because um, it is not done separately. It is done integrated with the, pro with the work. The impact for our students is, again, um, the uni this goes back to that diagram looking at the tier one, the universal instruction, um, and making sure that um, we include uh, differentiation, common teaching points, rubrics, assessments, um, that that articulation is uh, uh, vertically aligned um, so that, um, to give you an example, um, stating claims in fifth grade, the depth and expectation of stating a claim gets more and more um, uh, deep as we, as we move through the grade levels. Um, literacy across disciplines. Um, so for example, writing engages deeper thinking and learning in every content area um, and higher order thinking um, that takes place as we go across disciplines. So in other words, we don't just say um, English teachers at the secondary level, you've got this. This really is an ownership of across the disciplines. Um, and so Lori and Barbara um, coordinate the disciplinary literacy teams. So they bring in science teachers, family and consumer education teachers, technology and education teachers. Um, of all different as examples to really work on how we're going to embed um, the skills that we're trying to build in there in those classes as well and then ensuring that the um, that the practices um, uh, engage all of our students and by those culturally responsive practices also we recognize there's little things like um, allowing students to turn and talk so the opportunity to converse with one another because some students based upon their background or their individual preference are not very um, uh, oral in a large group setting. So in, in encouraging our staff to utilize different pedagogical strategies that engage all learners has, has been a big part of this work as well. So we know literacy is important, um, but we have a couple of quotes for you from uh, a couple of different sources that kind of reinforce this work. Um, one is from a, uh, one of our consultants that we've referred to, Shiraki Holly. Having strong literacy skills, reading, writing, listening, and speaking is the gatekeeper to success in almost all academic subject, subjects. And our own Department of Public Instruction will say um, the ability to read, write, think, speak, listen, uh, and listen in different ways and for different purposes begins early and becomes increasingly important as students pursue specialized fields of study in high school and beyond. We know this work is critical, um, and we're putting the time and resources and energy um, into making it happen. 
So we've had, we have some next steps coming up, but we also have some big successes um, in the past. So um, I sent out uh, with you um, through the board letter, um, again, a lot of our successes are those essential standards, common unit plans um, for, for our staff to um, on essential writing skills, those pacing guides, those anchor charts, um, all those resources that are in place. And then building off of that, um, looking at, we're very curious on the state assessment data um, as well to see how we're doing with our gaps. This is a, a, our first year coming up that we're going to be able to really dig in and say, okay, so we've done the work. Um, are we starting to see some of the impact in that work? And so that data will start coming to us at the state level this summer. And then our staff will continue that um, implementation work. Um, we begin two weeks from today. It's going to be the first um, set, and then uh, right before the new teacher orientation in August will be um, our next round. Um, and then getting that curriculum developed in the reading area. That was a lot. Um, I tried to tie it, though, if you noticed the snow days, so I was really uh, right from the clinic. Um, questions that you might have? Yeah. I may be asking a question too soon, but um, before I do that, I want to thank you for the presentations. You bet. My question is, closing the gap, um, I know that we usually compare how we close the gap with the state data. Um, where will where we see the local desirable established data or target, I should say. You mean with the local assessments? Uh, our own. Right. And so we've already begun some of that. Um, I think part of our work also is to um, look at making sure that we have, we, so we have data from our local assessments. Part of what we're trying to do as well is ensure the validity and reliability of the tools that we're using. Um, and so the analysis, we've begun that um, process already. Um, we just aren't at a place yet to be able to report back to you on it. We plan to do that uh, initially through uh, one of the Friday letters. Um, but we're just starting to get to that spot now to be able to um, look at both our local data as a district. Um, our teams have already been able to look at that data at a building level or a classroom level. But um, to be able to do a district analysis, we are just beginning that process now. Follow-up questions. Sure. So on a very difficult topic like culturally response, mm -hmm. how do we know where we are at and where we, do we want to go? Yep. So part of also the work that we do um, is uh, there's a, we, we often will survey our staff. There's a tool that we've used in the past for staff to be able to um, give feedback on. It's, a, it's an inventory on using um, classroom supportive practices. Um, and so we will continue to um, uh, survey our staff in terms of their implementation um, moving forward and that that tends to help us infer um, how well their practices are supporting culturally responsive practices um, but it's this is part that's just one of the tools that we'll be using as well and I might add too that through the educator effectiveness observation tools that principals use when they go into um, you know to observe classrooms uh, they are also looking to see whether or not those culturally relevant practices are actually being used and if there's evidence of that use through the teacher performance. So there's some feedback to teachers if they're not seeing those kinds of strategies in place, kind of wondering like, when will I see them? How, you know, could I come back and observe those? So putting an emphasis um, on those strategies and then monitoring to make sure that they're being used through the educator effectiveness tool. I'll also say thank you. It's a tremendous undertaking and thanks to all the school work teams, staff work teams, past and future, and it sounds like a huge thanks to go to Barb and Lori. So much appreciated. Um, I want to apologize to the audience. I forgot after the first report to ask if anyone here had questions or needed clarification. So let's start with um, Mr. Schmidt's report on English language arts. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay. And the first report, inclement weather, makeup days. Any questions for, for clarification for Ms. Marks? All right, final report. Uh, 
Uh, this is an item for discussion, uh, new policy number 513, job description and labor market review. So once again, no, no board action is required on this tonight. Um, if the board is comfortable with the draft, we could conduct a first reading. Revisions can be made before a final draft is brought forward as a cons um, an item in the consent resolution. Do, um, do people feel comfortable having a first reading or not? What was your feeling about that? This did come to you from the Policy and Governance Committee with a 3-0 vote in favor of bringing it forward for a first reading. Okay, thank you. So it's the procedure to read this as a new policy to read the full, to read the entire document, is correct? Okay. So maybe I'll begin and then I'll pass to, okay. And... Where do I begin? <laughs> I haven't thought about that. With the first paragraph? Okay, thank you. <laughs> With the development of the new compensation model implemented in July 2016, the salary grade for each position in the district was established based on, upon the job description of said position in conjunction with labor market standards. To assure that position salary grade placement remains appropriate and equitable, the district will conduct systematic reviews of both hourly and salaried positions as identified here. Sure. Uh, annually, the district will work with a compensation consultant to evaluate all salary grade placements within a given group. If adjustments are recommended based on the current labor market and position description, adjustments may take place on July 1st of the following year, pending school board approval. Certified job descriptions will be reviewed with evaluation of the certified salary schedule in conjunction with, with labor market standards. And if adjustments are recommended based on the current labor market and job description, adjustments may take place on July 1st of the following year, pending school board approval. The reviews will occur on a five-year cycle for each identified group and shall not be subject to appeal. During the cycle year, the district will review job descriptions for each position within a given group and adjustments will be made as necessary. Do board members have any questions about the new policy or recommendations for revisions? Uh, yeah. um, so the intention of this is, um, Dr. Hardback, we talked about uh, around compensation equity and is this related to that or is, it, is, it, is that really the crux of this? I just want to make sure I'm reading through the, <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to contextualize this as something to help avoid some of the leapfrogging issues that we've seen in the past. And uh, does it have another component to it? Is that really the the bulk of it, or is there more to it? Than um, so this is the this would be the, the foundational policy for the work that would come in. There's a little uh, link somewhere in there that I don't know is is showing up uh, where it says here. Um, and so that would identify uh, the reviews and when those reviews would occur. And as our salary schedule is outlined now, um, there are predictable increases uh, at each job level and it's predicated on whether or not a person has been employed for a certain amount of time and whether or not they have received a um, satisfactory evaluation. And so we just have to make sure that the salaries that have been set are reflective of what the market value of that job is. Um, there are hard to fill jobs, um, in, for example, in special education um, and um, OTPTs and things like that. And so uh, from time to time, we may have to examine those positions to see if we're competitive in the marketplace. Thank you. So are we talking about sort of at the moment, is it, it's not, it's not that we're changing from having a single schedule for a uh, salary schedule for all to having individual by position. That's not really the change here. 
So perhaps Kay yeah. could talk a little bit about that process. So um, if you're referring to the certified salary schedule for all the positions within the certified group, uh, no, we're not looking at going from one salary schedule for all to different salary schedules depending on the position. Um, that wouldn't be what we're looking to do with that piece. But it, what we would be looking to do is make sure that when it's um, the year that the certified group is up for evaluation that we are doing an in-depth evaluation with the compensation consultant to make sure that even though we created the salary schedule um, and did all the work back you know just prior to implementing it in July of 2016 that our salary schedule is still labor market standard relevant and that we haven't lost the ground that we made when we put this all into place um, by sitting stagnant. We have to make sure that we're continuing to be relevant um, in the labor market. And so for the certified group, that would be the piece that, that we're doing with that. Not that we're saying, well, an English teacher is going to get paid this, where an OTPT will get paid this, and you know the library media specialist will get paid this. It wouldn't be to do that. Um, the other component that this policy does um, that um, policy and governance worked with us on was um, looking at the reclass policy. And this is the language that um, replaces the reclass policy. And so this is what we already talked about last time with the handbook language. When I presented the handbook language and we talked about this piece, because this is actually in the handbook, because it's very pertinent to employees. And so there's some things that are both in policy and the handbook. So this is the piece that replaces the actual um, reclass policy for hourly employees. And when we worked with um, the Employee Relations Committee on that language, we expanded it to, um, with the guidance of the P&G Committee, to encompass all positions within the district and not and make it very systematic so it wasn't about me personally that I feel I deserve this it's more about um, the district evaluating every position on a systematic basis um, in conjunction with the consultant to make sure that we are being um, salary market relevant and so it's this policy that replaces that need for an employee to go out on their own and develop their own documents that say, here are all the reasons, ECASD, school board, and administration, that I'm worth more than what you're currently paying me. And that's the process that we did have in place since the new compensation model, and, um, and it wasn't serving the needs that I think that the board and administration were hoping that that was going to serve. And so this will be much more um, relevant and systematic in trying to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to keep those positions at a, at a um, labor market standard that's relevant. Thank you. So if, if the, um, I'm just trying to understand um, in practice how, how this would work. So it, as we're addressing it in terms of, um, I had a little bit of a different understanding of this, I think, just, and it was very vague, and I, it's obviously a lot of good work has gone into it here, and I'm just trying to catch up a little bit. Um, so if you'll indulge me, the, the idea of, um, we're going to, we're going to, I think one of the ideas we had was a very sim simple version of this for, for leapfrogging concerns was we're going to be aware of for certain classes of positions, say English teacher at the secondary level, let's say, uh, we're going to be aware of where our current employees are in terms of salary level, make sure that we don't hire anybody above that uh, within that group. Now that that's a that may be a simplistic and maybe even wrong from the beginning notion in my head of how this would have worked. I gather this is working quite differently than that. Right. Yep. That's not Does, what this policy addresses. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't really. This policy isn't trying to deal necessarily with the leapfrogging question so much. Correct. Okay. Okay. This is looking at moving forward, system wide, every single position, the district taking ownership that we will review every single position. A new process with the intention of what well what's in this um, with the intention of kind of what's in the second and third paragraph which is that adjustments could then be recommended to go to the board to approve or disapprove uh, of. adjustments of existing levels to move, move them a bit faster perhaps along the schedule would that be an example of how this might manifest itself yep and when you say um, so 
like commissioner lucan bill said the modifications would be in the position placement on the salary schedule and not individual people and so this is so for example if we're going to say that the um, maintenance to position once we go through this process and we identify that the maintenance to position which maybe is currently identified as a salary grade 13 I, i'm just guessing i have no idea but once we go through this process if the evidence shows that for a salary grade the labor market would indicate that that should really be at a salary grade 14 we would bring all that information to the board and say based upon salary labor market standards this is what's being recommended and here's what the cost of the district would be to change that salary grade on our salary schedule and move the people currently in that position to the salary grade here's the cost to that that's how that process would work so it wouldn't be individually picking specific people out of a job and saying well you've been here for this long and this is where you're at it's about the position and what that position is valued at in the labor market and saying this position is currently not being valued but where it should be and this is the cost of moving it forward and that's the information that would come to the board and it includes certified as well as non-certified yes so, every position and in terms of certified it would be broken up sort of by it's, I guess the link isn't working the click here maybe would show me uh, every, some more every, pos every position um, the, the key that um, the employee relations committee focused on we had a lot of conversation about how this worked for the certified group because it is yeah. one salary schedule for so many different positions yes. um, but was what was really beneficial about including the certified group in this is that if they're in many years ago there was only one job description basically for all certified positions and it was basically teacher um, and now as more and more unique positions are evolving like the dual immersion teacher um, or any other uh, position that you could identify quickly we're getting more specific in a job description as to what that particular position requires in terms of certifications or requirements or licensures or whatever and so as we work through this process it'll be either updating job descriptions in those areas or creating them for specific um, positions that are a little bit more unique than a standard classroom position that requires a different level of something um, that would be important for everybody to know if they were applying for or looking at what's required of their position mm -hmm. so it talks about requirements for the job skill requirements for the job but also could adjust does it adjust the sort of point of entry on the schedule for different groups Don't zero versus no so mm -hmm. what how, and then for the certified group how does it manifest itself these decisions and changes because that piece would be looking at our beginning salary schedule like level a bachelor's yeah. level a and comparing that with labor market standards Hmm. and that would be that just, would be the just piece. that level yes. a and, and the reason for point, that yeah. is because that's the only group of all of our employees that we bargain base wage with hmm. and placement of the money on the salary schedule so that piece has to be different so what we would do with the consultant is say are we labor market relevant with where we're currently at with our beginning wage for base for our um, bachelor's beginning teacher salary and if it isn't then in the work that we do in those bargaining sessions that would be part of what we would discuss but because that's the only group that we have that bargaining with that was a piece that we worked a lot of different languages around and then we just said we don't need to indicate that in this because we know that that's the piece that is different than everything else I think one thing too to keep in mind is that prior to this new compensation model in 2016 um, because of salary freezes and reductions um, we had slowly and maybe more quickly than we thought fallen behind in the labor market and we were having difficulty retaining teachers because of pay and other positions as well and having a study like this that was done initially to establish that compensation model helped us to uh, establish the baseline as Kay's talking about with the base wage and to keep us competitive mm -hmm. and uh, that has certainly been something that we've heard that the board values thank you
Are there any questions or requests for clarification from the audience? Okay. So uh, this, I, I appreciate a thanks to policy and governance for bringing forward this new um, proposal. And this strikes me, um, I think initially that the thought would it would be brought forward as part of a consent resolution agenda. I guess I'm looking for others' advice. Uh, this strikes me as a particularly important policy uh, where that we might want to have as, an, as something that is individually considered so that there, let's see, I know that I've learned some new things tonight and there might be especially staff members who would like to be able to engage more around this that wouldn't have the opportunity as part of a consent agenda? I would concur that we have it individually agenda. Um, an example of why I said that is, is, is a, there is a key word in there that we are hoping that um, would help alleviate potential misunderstanding or conflict. The word, uh, the group shall not be subject to appeal because we didn't have things like this. We had issues that were very valid but hard to address. So I think in the future, board need to understand that there are two phases to what we are voting. A is we are looking at the will, the could. But then the second part is once you vote this, it doesn't mean that you can or should. In other words, the board still had that responsibility to think clearly and be more creative on how to finance a desired direction. So voting doesn't mean it's going toward that automatically. So would I be correct in saying that this brings us to requests for future agenda items? We have reached that point. Um, are there any requests? We have uh, a few things from tonight's meeting that we know we'll carry forward to July. Are there any other requests? I'm, I'm reminded of the compensation equity discussion, which we have still open, and um, some form or another for that to come back. Other requests? Okay, hearing none. I will move adjournment tonight in honor of Patty Iverson. <laughs> Second. Those in favor say aye. 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 No, Patty, aye. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Our meeting is adjourned. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the Eau Claire Area School Board. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.